All right, so let's let's start on on doing some stuff here. Uh, I'm going to open up. So this is the endogenous growth slides. Oops, okay, and uh, yeah, so we went through this stuff, sort of, um, and I jumped over to the iPad. So at the end, though, we got to um, this result here. Uh, wonder. Um, so is this is when for for the slides here is this blurry in the same way that the other stuff is blurry? It's just sort of like less of a problem in this case. Okay, I see, but it's the same. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. Okay, so you can read but like the math stuff. You can read the, that for the most part. Yeah. Okay. Okay. People are good in general with the with the math, like reading the small math stuff. Good. All right. Cool. All right. Okay. Yeah. I guess it's just one of those one of those things with the algorithms. Um. Okay. Um. All right. So then I'll keep it like this. But if it, if it changes, you know, just let me know. Um. Okay, so so we got the singularity result. Okay, really more of a curiosity when phi, you know. So just to jump back, real quick. Okay, so the the foundation here is this production function for ideas, right? It tells you you got a certain number of ideas or technology or whatever. Um, a today you put in some researchers, you have these parameters, and that spits out new ideas. Okay, so that's all. That's it. And then we're just sort of thinking about the implications of that relatively simple assumption. Okay. Um, and then you know essentially when you think about it in growth rate terms you're, you have a balance of forces between um in uh, the number of researchers you're putting in and how much more difficult new ideas are getting to produce because you've already produced old uh existing ideas okay so it's just really just the balance of forces for those two um and that that yields a specific growth rate wherein the numerator which is growing at sort of a fixed rate uh, is growing at the same rate as the denominator which is what we're trying to figure out the, the rate of. Okay, so um, that's what gives you this result here that G is just equal to sum. If you have a um, researchers growing a population as well, which um, they kind of are, okay, um, then you get this constant growth rate. Okay, uh, and it's a constant growth rate that's not a function of the number of, uh, it's not a function of the fraction of researchers S that you're using, which is which was surprising to people. Okay. Um, but, and so, so that's less, that's only for phi less than one. Okay. And then phi equals one. Okay. That's the knife edge case. All right. And you get a growth rate that actually is a function of S. Okay. But you also get that, um, any type of population growth would induce, uh, accelerating growth, which is sort of problematic. Okay. Um, and then, uh, when you go to the phi greater than one world, then things get really wild. You get the singularity um infinite uh growth in finite time and uh i think yeah so um i, I last time i said infinite growth in, in finite time means infinite output that might not technically be true I, it's true in this case but it's one of those things where if you integrate um one over x squared up to like zero that's still uh or wait no if you integrate one over if, yeah so if you integrate one over x squared to zero what do you or no sorry one over x or something like that then you can get like a, a finite result so yeah so one over x gives you log which is infinite but then anything you know uh, one over x squared rate would give you a finite result yeah okay so then depending on that exponential you could get something where you have you know an infinite uh an integral where the integrand is going to infinity but the, the integral itself is still finite so now that so that's the general the general statement doesn't hold but in this case if you do integrate it um because you basically have uh the last equation here the growth rate um is equal to this function which is asymptoting up to infinity at, at time uh, t of, of like one over g zero one over five minus one where that where that numerator term hits zero okay um so you're asymptoting now you can you know g is a dot over a Right, so you could you could actually 
solve that and, and show like the you can just do it here. So you can you can um this is you know that's a that exact equation that we just derived. Okay. Here. Uh right here. Okay, so you know, so that's eight oops, that's eight out of array. Right, is that's just G here is is eight out of array. Okay. Um so then you know this would be Something like this. Okay, so just sort of repeating it. Um, but then we also know that uh, this is d log of a dt. Okay, so, uh, so we can in it. We can actually just integrate um, both sides with respect to t, right? So then we'll get um, you know the log of a of t is uh, well. I, we, there's going to be a initial condition, but we can get the log of a of t, move this up a little bit here, um, is going to be something like a, a log, okay, uh, you know, so we're going to get like something like g0 over 1 minus 5 times g0, which is actually going to cancel, so we'll get something like this, okay. But, you know, evaluated from zero to T star. Okay, so uh, you'll still, um, and there's a minus sign there. So you'll still, uh, you'll still get an infinite answer because at zero, that evaluates to zero. Okay, but then at T star, T star is where that numerator term, which is just what we have in here, hits zero. That log is going to go minus infinity with the minus sign is plus infinity. Okay, so this is, this is still infinite. Okay, so and since log of a is infinite, that means a is, a is infinite. Okay, so you can show analytically that it, it does indeed. It's not just sort of like a blip. It actually is a, a leading to infinite output. So probably not going to happen, right? Because other things will break down. Right? Like you, the assumptions will break down if you if you push them too far, right? So, um, okay, so that's really more of a curiosity, though. You know, don't worry about that too much. We're, we're just going to forget about the singularity stuff and just assume phi is equal to one. As I said last time, phi is equal to one. We're going to assume that for the most part. Uh, and then we'll do a little forays into phi less than one, only because it's it's more difficult to think about phi less than one oftentimes. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, now we're going to go fully endogenous. Hold on. All right. So, um, okay. Let me give you the lay of the land here. Okay. And there's, a, there's, a, there's many different ways you can go here when you go to fully endogenous, okay? So, but, but we'll, essentially what we want to do is have some more sophisticated process. Uh, you know, the, the eight, that eight out equation is probably still roughly going to hold, at least in the aggregate, okay? What we want to have is some sophisticated process for how R is being chosen, the number of researchers, okay? Just like we did with Romer to endogenize S. We want to endogenize this, other thing, which I'm also calling S, I guess. Um, it, we want to endogenize that, that research share. Okay, so um, we're going to do that, all right? And so then we need to think about, well, why? Okay, what's the unit of research? What's the unit of, of technology? Why are people doing this? Okay, why are people doing research? And, and um, exactly how does it work? And what are the incentives that they face? Okay, so those are going to be the important types of questions, okay? Um, and and for, for most of the class this year, okay, we're going to be looking at sort of uh, private incentives. So like a, it, mostly you're thinking about like firms, basically. So you, the, the general framework is going to be, you've got firms that are um, doing research uh, of some sort, okay, generating new technology, perhaps new products, um, and, uh, you know, selling those on the market, okay. And there's probably going to be some implicit, at least patent system or intellectual property system, although I don't really like the term intellectual property. Uh, there's got to be some system by which they can, you know, uh, achieve at least a short-term monopoly, okay, and meaning short-term profits from those ideas. Because, you know, in general, ideas are often easy to replicate or they're easy for other people to adopt once you come up with them and publicize them. Uh, so, if it, you know, you may need um, or may want some type of uh, short-term protection for that, okay? So that would be like a patent system. Okay. Um, all right. So we're, but for the policy side and the patent side, we're going to take most of the time, we're going to take that as a given, maybe something like an infinite length patent. Um, 
when and then later on if we have time we'll we'll think more about that in detail and thinking how can you, what happens if you change policy and, and what are the considerations there okay um all right and so so that's that's the basic idea um we're gonna largely speaking there are two classes of models in this world okay there's essentially kind of two options for how do you think about the the advancement of technology one which which i'm going to call kind of a romer type step type model um because the the paul, paul romer uh sort of pioneered this this what thinking concretely in this in this way um and that's going to be where you're you have what's called expanding variety so you're, you're coming up with new types of products okay so um you know so you can think about like uh you know, historically i guess a smartphone would be a, a new type of product okay uh maybe like something like vr or goggles today would be a little bit more uh something that's on the horizon potentially um and uh yeah so you can think about it like that you can also think about it um in, in other, so I, I, I'm going to mostly talk about things as like products, product lines, um, <clears throat> but you can think about it as any kind of idea space sort of thing. You can think about it as content, like, like songs or movies or things like that. Uh, anything where you sort of, you're coming up with a new idea, you know, there's potentially some substitution between these different things, but, but, but there's, there's sort of a lot of different types of ideas you could come up with, right? Um, so so that, that type of logic could apply to, to multiple different settings, but I'll usually focus on on something like products, uh, okay? Um, yeah, so so now in the Romer model, you know, it's, um, you know, if you think about like a, a smartphone, it doesn't matter what brand exactly, but think about a smartphone, um, yeah, it, it it's a new product in, in a sense. I mean, people sort of envisioned them for a while uh, you know, they probably had something like it on Star Trek at various points in time or other science fiction, but, it, you know, they couldn't really make them because they didn't have the appropriate technology. So there's always this question, like, what's new? It's almost like the Platonic thing. Like, are, are there new ideas or are we just sort of discovering them? That's philosophical, I guess. But, um, you know, so so there, there's always interpretational issues with this stuff. But, you know, a new product, either you created the, the idea wholly uh, new or you, you you made it feasible to actually produce it something like that okay um so there's that and then the other thing is that even a smartphone is is really just a it, it satisfies existing needs like so, so everything a smartphone does we could more or less do i mean it, it just was more costly right so you you want to have uh you know you could have a calendar you just need to like hire you need to like buy a calendar or hire a person to manage it for you right so it's like it's just like it does existing tasks. It just does them better and, and much more cheaply. Okay, so um, we're gonna sort of not worry about that. We're just gonna say this is a new product. Okay, um, and that's that. Okay, you can you can kind of break it down and think about things more in like a, a task or a, a service based um, framework. But that that kind of gets needlessly complicated. I would say. All right, so. So that's Romer, that's creating new products. Okay. And then the other option is, well, okay, we're going to have the same products basically, um, but we're just going to make them cheaper or better in some way. Okay. And actually this, that kind of relates to that, the thing with the smartphone. So it's like, you know, we're going to, we're going to be doing the same things, but much more cheaply. Okay. So here it would be like more, you know, production techniques. Yeah. How do you um, make semiconductor manufacturing cheaper? How do you, uh, you know, or how do you, you know, make an equivalent speed microprocessor for, for less money or something like that? Okay. So, um that's 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 called quality ladder okay sometimes i call that schumpeter schumpeterian okay um model after joseph schumpeter who's a guy i don't know he's romer is like a, a real modern person who's alive and on twitter and also got a nobel prize um paul romer's also been really into like covid and like testing and stuff like that so lately um and then schumpeter uh not with us anymore he's like a couple hundred years he's probably like 100 plus years uh ago so he's more of a historical figure okay but he's pretty influential as as, as a economist although i think he probably wasn't called an economist he was probably called something else like a political economist but you know um the same thing that we do okay and and but the the basic idea is because you're making <clears throat> better versions of existing products that that induces a little bit more of a competitive edge to things right so now you i come up with a or not let's say let's say that when you comes up with a better version of a product okay you're gonna 
displace the incumbent that's, that's producing that product currently, right? So um, that's good for you, bad for them. Okay, it's gonna, there's, there's that, that, that's okay. And that, and so Schumpeter, he has this, well, I think well known phrase, creative destruction. He, he coined for that. Okay, so you, you're creating a new idea, but you're also destroying old value or you're at least sort of displacing it. Okay, and, and if you think about, you know, it's not just an entrepreneur, it's like the firm, it's the people that work there. So there's the potential for pretty large disruption. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess people call it disruption nowadays, right? So um, so that's um, that's the quality ladder. Okay, so if there's more of a competition kind of thing, okay, and actually you can you can you can get scope in, in either of these models actually for inefficiencies. Okay, so I didn't really say it that much, but with with Ramsey, basically everything we did was efficient. You know, there are certain forays we made. For instance, the climate uh, model would would probably lead to inefficient outcomes in a, in a let's say fair setting. Um, but but for the most part, things were kind of efficient because there were no externalities. Okay, here we are going to have externalities and and put the potential for inefficiency. So if you think about um, uh, in the Schumpeterian model, it's like you know you're, you're you're the new producer. You don't really care in some sense about the old producer that you've displaced. Okay, so you might think there's a little bit of an efficiency there. Uh, you're not internalizing that. Okay, so. Um, so that's fine. I think, I don't know, it's, it gets kind of boring when everything you write down is efficient. So it, it's going to be cool to have some inefficient models, although obviously efficiency is good. Um, just looking out in the world, there, there do appear to be some inefficiencies that we probably want to capture. Okay. Um, all right. So, so that's, and then, so, okay. So the Schumpeter, Schumpeter, is, I, I, don't know, I, I find it fascinating, the, the, the dynamics and the different ways you can think about it and how it sort of opens up scope for policy and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, if you think about Ro just to like contrast Ro Romer versus Schumpeter, you know, so there is still a competitive notion in Romer. Okay. Because, um, you know, the, the, we're going to, the, the way we're going to be thinking about these products is we're going to have like a continuum of products. Okay. And I'll get into more details in a minute and, and they're, they're going to be substitutable still. Not perfectly, but they're going to be partially substitutable. Okay, so it is the case that if you come up with a new product, your um, your uh, sort of uh, you're displacing other products in the sense that like people are going to switch towards yours sort of continuously. It's not quite as like aggressive as the Schumpeterian displacement that we're going to see. Okay, but it, but there is still kind of that dynamic to be to be honest. Um, so if you think about the the smartphone example, you're displacing you know. Uh, you know, services like you're displacing secretaries, you're displacing those paper calendars that people would buy, like you're displacing maps and things like that. So there, it's still happening. It's just kind of more spread out, I guess, in the in the rumor world. Okay, but it, but it's still a dynamic. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So that's yeah. So the, the, those are the two we'll look at now. Um, there's a bunch of different types of, of models you can you can write down here. I I don't want to go over, I mean, like, I can't go over all of them. I don't want to because I'm just going to give you these sort of two classes that I think is the most important. Um, in the textbook in Edgemoglu, uh, he has this lab equipment model, what he calls it a lab equipment model. I, I don't, it's okay. It's actually, it's good because it actually gives you a really simple, and it's very simple to derive the the, the outcome of the model relatively. Um, but I, I don't know. It doesn't. It doesn't seem very realistic to me. It, it's always. It, it's. <clears throat> it, it goes a bit too far in the making things, making certain assumptions to to induce um, simple outcomes. Okay, so we're still going to be able to solve these models. They're a little bit trickier, but we're still going to be able to solve them in, in closed form. So um, it'll be fine. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's that's that. All right, the goods aggregator. I put in a little gator alligator emoji because that's what I think of when I think of an aggregator. If you want to think of that, then you should. Okay. And there's so much variation in the, in the, cause you know, like these emojis, like the font they use, it'll look different. Like you're seeing this one, but if you look at your phone, there'll be a different one. So I, enjoy, I encourage you to explore all the various different types of uh, alligator emojis that show up. Okay. Um, okay. So the, the goods aggregator, uh, I might actually be jumping the gun here with, with going into the, the algebraic forms here, but uh, I, I actually, what I want to do is I'm going to give you like a model, a, a graphical bubble form model, model overview, how, like what, what's going on in, in total. And then I'll jump back to this, uh, stuff with the goods aggregator. Okay. So, um, let's go to the iPad. Okay. So this is like, this is, this is, this is a, a semi-abstract 
description of how an endogenous growth model works. Okay. Um, it's so it, it sort of will. Yeah, I mean, it, it'll you. It, this will encompass both the Schubertian and the Romer style models. Okay. So, but. Um, okay. So. Models, I guess. Um, here's the. Here's the basic idea. Okay, so we got think think about the core is semi endogenous. Okay, so we have like um, technology. Okay, so generally before we were calling that A. Okay, so let's turn that into a box. Okay, so what what's going to happen is um, so so in, in this case, so technology is basically going to lead. Okay, and this this is actually. Kind of where that, that goods aggregator is going to be important it's going to it's going to lead so so that this what is technology in these cases technology is sort of like what are kind of the products that are out there the current today what are the set of products that have been thought up both in terms of the the product itself and also how to, the, the process for producing it okay so that's technology that's going to lead to some sort of like product market outcome okay All right, so that's going to lead to some product market outcome, right? Which means, um, what does that mean? So, so it's like it means that uh, imagine each good was produced by a single firm, by a little monopolist, okay, and each individual good was produced by one firm. The product market outcome is going to be like their profits, or, or how much they produce, what price they charge, and hence what their input costs are and what profits they get, okay. But the pro the profits, in some sense, are the main uh, variable of interest, okay, because those are going to determine incentives, okay. So that's your, the state of technology will basically determine a product market outcome. That's, there's a lot going on in this arrow. Okay. But, but that's, that's, what's going to determine the product market outcomes. Of course, other stuff influences it, but for our purposes, we're interested in this technology to product market. So the idea is, you know, for instance, we're going to see, um, uh, uh, we're going to see, in the Romer case, it's it's going to be relatively simple. You're you're basically a monopolist that comes up with a new product, and you get a certain amount of profit. Okay. Um, uh, in the in the Schumpeter case, um, it's a little bit more complicated because, you know, maybe I make this product, okay, and I'm I'm like reasonably good at producing it, but then, you know, you might come along and and improve that process and make it for less money, okay. In which case you would displace displace me, okay. But I'm still kind of a competitor, right? So if you only do it like 1% better, you're not going to be able to charge that much money for it because I'm going to be right behind you doing almost Bertrand competition, right? So if you, if you try and charge an exorbitant amount, then people will just switch back to the existing, the, the old person the, who's only a little bit worse, okay? So, um, you you know, so the, the, the technological space there, you can see how it, it determines how much profit you can make. If you made something that's just far and away amazingly cheaper, you could charge a lot of money because you don't have much competition. So um, the, the, that's how sort of one instance where technology influences in a, in a real concrete way the, the product market outcome and in particular the profits that a firm can get. Okay. Um, all right. So then the firms, they're getting some profits that are a result of the product market outcome. Um, then they're going to do some innovation okay so uh let's call it research research and development or whatever r d or sometimes i'll call it innovation okay so all right um so so that in this and what that means is okay it's profitable to produce these goods okay and sell them depending to to a varying extent depending on technology um that means that coming up with a new type of good, doing research and coming up with a new type of good generates some stream of profits. Okay, so you can also think about like a V, like a present value of the whole stream of profits. Okay, so that's like, also you can think about V, the present value of that profit. Okay, so um, so that those are the incentives. The incentives for doing research are you come up with a new product, um, you're successful, you know, you start selling, you make a certain stream of profits and that has a certain present value. Okay, that's gonna be your, your benefit from doing research. There's some costs you have to pay your researchers um, and and buy equipment, whatever. Okay, uh, but that's going to inform some research and development decision. Okay, um, 
And that is then going to feed back into technology, okay? Because that is technology. You know, successful research and development creates new products, which is technology, okay? Or, or it makes things cheaper, which is technology, okay? So, um, okay, and then also, you know, there could also be spillovers. It, it may be that if I develop a certain product that makes it easier for you to develop a different type of product down the line, or you use it as an input. So it's not just within your own firm and your own self, but there could be spillovers, okay? Which are gonna induce potential inefficiencies as well, okay? Because they're not necessarily internalized, okay? Um, but this is the cycle, you know, technology, product to market, R&D decision, back to technology and just iterate, okay? So. So that's going to be the cycle for for almost any type of endogenous growth model that we're going to entertain. Okay. All right. So now uh, let's see. Okay. So yeah. It, it, and so in our world, that's that's general. Okay. So in our world, you know, the, what are the the main players going to be? Well, we're going to have. Total output. Okay, I'm just gonna usually I'll call it total output Y. Um, I we're we're gonna be in a fixed sat population world now because of that. We're gonna be in the knife edge case more or less. You'll see. Um, and so I'm gonna shut down population growth because otherwise things would would get wacky. All right. So so n n equals zero. Okay. And then and then just like you know l is gonna be one. Okay. Uh, we're going to have some <clears throat> researchers. This is a fraction or a total mass of people. Okay. So there's, there's one, the population is one. So it's, it's a fraction. Okay. Um, and we're going to have some producers. This is okay. This is capital P. I'm going to try and differentiate. This is uh, okay. So it's not a price. It's capital P. All right. And then, um, you know, it's going to be the case that one equals uh, P plus R is equal to one. Okay. So there's this either you're a producer or a researcher. Okay. And that's at, at the highest level. That is the decision that the most important decision you're making is how many researchers are there because how many researchers are there influences the path of technology and growth and product market outcomes. And then how many producers also influences product market outcomes because if you have fewer producers, products are more, um, expensive in some sense to, to produce or that you're, you're producing less of them basically. So the trade-off really is it's, it's a, it's a intertemporal trade-off of producing today versus having people be researchers and, and potentially making more output in the future. Okay. So it, it's a simple, uh, not simple, but it's a complicated intertemporal trade-off. Okay. Um, okay. So then, yeah. And, and, in terms of the product markets, okay, basically um, we're gonna have uh, that Y, okay, this is like that, this is like how they draw in game theory, right? Um, that Y is gonna be produced from from a continuum, like like in this case, zero to uh, N, and, and N is the total number of products of, of intermediate goods, okay? So these intermediate goods are like specific product lines specific products, okay, produced by individual firms, okay, uh, and then they're going to get all aggregated together. That's a good ag goods aggregator, okay? So um, <clears throat> and so that's going to produce output, okay? Um, research is going to add on, you know, res research is going to be like N dot. It's going to generate, it's going to be the generation of new products, Okay, that's going to be the output of research, successful research. Okay, so R basically R is going to map into N dot. That's going to be our, our production function for ideas. You, you hire researchers. Hopefully, they come up with new products. Okay, so so you're you're um, okay. So you're getting more products. Uh, now the idea is okay. So we have a fixed population though, right? So um, we only have a certain amount of. You know, the, the most we can do is put everyone into production in terms of output, right? So we really are relying on technology to improve. Okay. And so basically this, this expansion of the um, number of products is what's going to be driving uh, technology. Okay. It, it, for, we're going to, we're going to have only a fixed amount of people, but we, we're going to get more and more products. And that's actually going to uh, drive this growth in, in output. 
Okay, so um, it seems a well. Actually, now I think about it, it seems kind of weird. I mean, it's like we're not, you know, it's not like we're doing more with less. Okay, we're we're. We're, we kind of are, okay? But it's not like we're producing these goods more cheaply, okay? The marginal cost is going to be the same. It's just that we're, we're creating more and more varieties, which people value, basically. They value, or the, the production function kind of induces them to value. Um, and that increases output and it increases uh, welfare and everything like that, okay? So um, <clears throat> so that's that's this the love of variety, okay? So people like variety. They, knew, they like new types of goods and that continues at infinitum okay so so that's that's sort of how the Roman model works okay so let's um at this point we, we want to be a little bit more specific okay so i'm gonna start going through um Romer in a bit more detail okay so um all right so that good aggregator okay that now now let's let's talk about that so what we're gonna do is i'm gonna write down the goods aggregator we'll talk about it um We'll think about how the product market works and kind of go down, start going down the line of thinking of, of what different, what basically what is going to be the product market outcome. Okay, so, um, all right, so that goods aggregator is going to look like this. All right, so you're going to inter, you're going to have some integral over all your current products. Okay, and so the the exponents are a little bit funky. Okay, but you can see it's basically CES. Okay, this is this is basically CES, but it's over a continuum. It's it's constant returns to scale, right? If you double each yi, it's going to factor through because the exponents are inverses of one another. That's going to factor through as a doubling of, of total output. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, but um, increasing. Well, okay, so so. This is okay. We'll we'll go into more detail on this, but but if you want to think about how does Romer how does how does this Romer model generate growth? Okay, so think about it, you have a fixed number of workers as n is growing. Okay, and and actually the, the outcome is I can just tell it to you now, and then we can we can talk about how it arises. You have a fixed number of workers p. Okay, and the weight and and I guess I didn't say this the weight the 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 production function for those little y i's. Is actually going to be very, very simple. The simplest possible production function you could ever imagine, which is that you put in one worker and you get out one yi. Okay, so it's just marginal cost of one worker, which will have they'll have a wage, so marginal cost will be w. Okay, but but you put in one worker, you get out one one unit of yi, regardless of which i you're talking about. So there's a continuum of i's, remember, but they're all kind of identical, right? They go into the production function in the same way. And they're produced at marginal cost of in terms of labor of one. Okay. Um, so just very simple. Okay. Um <clears throat> so so how how is it gonna play out? So so I'll peel the symmetry and then sort of show you that, that it holds up. If 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 these products are all identical, everything's symmetric, things are nice and concave, it turns out, in, in certain ways. Okay, which means that the, the outcome is gonna be symmetric. The outcome is gonna be the same for every i okay which which in particular means that um if, if we have a total amount of production labor p then each li should just be p over n right so you have a total amount of production labor p you have n product lines so you're going to split them evenly in a symmetric outcome okay and then this l this yi the our production function also tells us that that's equal to yi okay so you have this production you're just splitting it between all your product lines evenly due to symmetry okay um okay so then uh what does that imply well we can actually plug that into i'm gonna draw a real arrow here we can plug that into our goods aggregator right up above right and and see what that implies okay um now you might think that it implies that y itself is equal to p over n but you need to remember about the integral okay so um yeah, so what's y going to be? So uh, I'll, I'll just write it out in great detail. So if we just plug it in, we get this. OK. Um, right. 
And, uh, okay, so now we can factor out <clears throat> the P over N uh, from the integral, because it's, it's, sorry, there should be a DI here, I guess. We can factor out the integral, uh, sorry, the P over N from, from the integral, because it doesn't depend on I, right? We can factor it out of the, the square brackets too, right? And it's going to come out as a P over N. Right, so we can we can factor it out all the way. Basically, the sort of constant returns the scale. Okay, but we still have an integral left over. Okay, so we still have zero to n, basically of you know one times di. Okay, to the epsilon over epsilon minus one. Okay, so there's still that the di in there. Basically, you can't just kill off the integral. Okay, now the integral of di from zero to n is just I evaluated from zero to n, which is just n minus zero or n. Okay, so that thing, the integral evaluates to n because it's constant over an n length interval. That means the, so the integral of one over an n length interval is n. Okay, so it's going to be now p over n times n, and then that's still raised to the epsilon over epsilon minus one. Okay, and then the last thing we need to do is just uh, you know combine those. Um, n exponents so it's it's epsilon over epsilon minus one minus one which it turns out is if you do the the if you combine the fractions you get one over epsilon minus one okay so it's actually not so bad okay all right so that's that's your right, I remember this is y so this is what we get for total output okay that's a p uh times n to the one over epsilon minus one okay so um yeah, all right, so that means that um, total output is, you know, it's increasing in P, right? So if you if you put in more production, you get more output. That makes sense. It's sort of concentration to scale, okay? Uh, and it's linear in that for that reason, okay? Um, but, you know, P can be at most one, so that's not going to give you any sort of growth. Now, N, also, it's also increasing in N, all right? It's, it's modulated by that one over epsilon minus one exponent, but it's increasing in N. Um, and so, uh, if N is growing without bound, it's growing continually, continually coming up with new products. It, let's say, you know, at a you know, constant growth rate, so exponentially, um, you're going to generate continual growth and output too. Okay. Because this production function, this goods aggregator is set up in such a way that, uh, new products are, are always valued. People just love getting new types of products. Okay. Then, uh, it'll, it'll give that to you. Okay, so, um, yeah, and so, you know, from this, I mean, you can even work out, right, so if, if you want to know, like, suppose we're in a long run growth path kind of thing, right, on a, on a long run growth path, P is going to be roughly constant, right, so in the long run, when, we sit, when things settle down, we're going to end up with some P's, the fraction of workers that are doing production, and the fraction of workers that are doing research R. Okay, but n is going to be growing. Okay, so let's let's in general, I'm gonna have I'm gonna say g is the growth rate of whatever is like our driving force for uh, technology. Okay, so in the in the case of Romer, oops, um, I am going to say that g is going to be n dot over n. Okay, which is which is just g n, right? So, um, so. Yeah, I could just always write GN, but I'm going to, yep. Yeah. Um, so let me think. Uh, we're, I mean, it, we're going to, we're going to assume epsilon is greater than one for the most part. Okay. So yeah. So you could, uh, yeah. Cause if it's zero, sorry, if it's less than one, then N is, is bad. And that is sort of unintuitive. Uh, so yeah, so we're going to assume it's for now, strictly greater than one. When you hit one, right, in the same way that we went going from CES to Cobb Douglas, right, when you hit one, you actually converge to a logarithmic style aggregator. And actually things are, they end up being kind of qualitatively different. So when we do Schumpeter, we're actually going to be in epsilon equals one world for various reasons. But um, for Romer, we're going to, we're going to set, we're going to have to say that epsilon is strictly greater than one. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So then, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, at some point I'll circle back and, and go through how that, that convergence works. Okay, but um, yeah, so then, so here, uh, if if we say that you know, G is GN, then that's going to mean 
that GY is going to be, well, in I mean, to assume that um, we're in steady state, okay, P is not changing over time. So GY in, in sort of that long run, okay, is going to be G over epsilon minus one, okay, right, which we're assuming now is, is positive, uh, or is greater than one. So then this gives us a, a well defined growth rate, okay. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, so then, uh, okay, so now I guess it all sort of makes sense. Like a piece of people like variety and, and the, we've constructed it in such a way that continual growth and new, continual creation of new products, actually people, they keep liking it. Okay, so, you know, that's an assumption, right? So you, you might think that people are like, yeah, it's, it's good to have new products, but like, frankly, I'm happy with what I have now. Like, I'm, I'm good, all right? I don't need it. I don't need a, a automated juicing machine or something like that. Okay, so um, maybe yeah. So so we are assuming that in a certain sense that people just will will keep adopting new products and then keep enjoying them. Okay, and that that firms or researchers will be able to continually come up with new ones. Right. So, um, but if you buy that, this is what you get. Okay. So um, and we can think a little bit about what's the intuition for uh, uh, let's see. So what's the intuition for epsilon? Uh, like in particular, this relationship. So how how sort of epsilon controls how how good new products are in terms of generating more output growth. Okay, right. So so if if epsilon is uh, so let's see let's let's look at the extreme. So first let's think about a very large value for epsilon. Okay, so as epsilon goes to infinity, then this that goods aggregator at the top actually converges to a linear aggregation. Right, that y is just the integral of yi, okay? Because the each of whether it's one over or not, it's it's going to converge to one, okay? When epsilon goes to infinity, so that means uh, <clears throat> and and then gy is going to be very small, okay? So we're going to have sort of like minimal gains, and essentially uh, the the idea is that when 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 epsilon is very large and the the production function is linear, these goods are highly substitutable, right? Um, think about, because, uh, remember you only have a fixed amount of production, okay. Uh, production labor. Okay. So when you, when you get all these goods, you're thinning out your population into producing less and less of more goods. Okay. But if all the goods are perfect substitutes, just put all your production into those original goods that you have and, and you're not going to lose anything, right? Because you, you, you pull out a little bit from the more advanced goods and put them in the, the less advanced goods is, is the same okay because everything is linear okay um and so those new those additional goods are not that useful okay because they're they're substitutes for your, your existing goods okay um all right so that's that's sort of the linear extreme all right now when epsilon gets smaller it's, you know, when it goes closer to one these goods are more and more uh sorry they're they're less and less substitutable okay so those new goods are really sort of new goods in a, in a real distinct way Okay, um, they're, they're useful in different ways. Um, and so uh, you value them more, okay? And so then that's gonna generate more growth and output, right? Um, and then uh, let's see, I'm trying to think, right? I, I don't, I need to think a little bit more about it. Epsilon less than one, um, they start being things kind of break down with epsilon less than one because they they start being complements. Um, and I think uh, well, I yeah I need to think about exactly why they break down, but they do break down. Okay, so um, maybe yeah I'll, I'll think about that and we can we can if, if we have time go go back to the next class. Okay, so um, but but for now we're gonna we're gonna deal with. In, in the epsilon greater than one world and, and you get this intuition about substitution. Okay. Um, and uh, what we're going to see also, okay. So that's sort of thinking about output um, sort of analogously. If, if you think about uh, profits, we're going to derive the profits of firms that are selling these substitution is going to be important there too. Okay. So, you know, profits, you know, in this world, we want uh, firms to do things that increase output. Okay, so so in, in a in a perfect world, profits would be a very good proxy for how much additional output you're producing as a firm. 
okay? Because profits are what firms are chasing. In, a, in, a, in an efficient world, firms should be chasing things that in, in, increase output, okay? So, so there should be a nexus or a relationship between profits and, and output, okay? And so you do see that here because um, when, when we solve it, and you can, you can kind of see it intuitively, if, for, if goods are highly substitutable, you're not gonna be able to make many profits, okay? If you come along and, and you have this new product that's just like, it's a perfect substitute for an old product, you're not gonna be, you're not generating that much additional value, you're not gonna be able to charge that much money for it over, over the existing product, okay? Because you have stiff competition from, from the old products. Um, and then, you know, in the other direction, if, if, if uh, these goods are not substitutable, then yeah, you're gonna be able to charge more profits, okay? So it's gonna influ influence profits in sort of the, in using that same intuition about substitutability, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's cool. I mean, so, so it's interesting because, you know, we didn't, we haven't thought about prices, selling stuff, incentives, or anything like that. We've just been doing a sort of mechanistic, you know, accounting level aggregate thing. We we actually gotten some of the answers already about at least out total output and growth. Okay, um, but we do need to to think of we do need to get profits and we need prices, we need choices, and we need to think about incentives. Okay, so that's that's why we're going to have to sort of step back and 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 take some derivatives, basically. Okay, so um, all right, so 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 how do we do that? Let's see. So we have um, we have a little bit of time. Um, so what we're gonna do is wait. So we have about twenty minutes, right? So um, we're gonna work out some of the product market. I think I think we can get a good amount done, right? So um, here's how it's gonna happen. We, we, we want to be careful about, so you want to be careful about the assumptions that you make or the assumptions that we are going to make uh, about the product markets, okay? So basically, um, each of these YI intermediate, they're, they're, we're going to call those intermediate goods or, or producers or whatever, each of those YIs is produced by one monopolistic firm, okay? Um, they are uh, they're gonna be optimizing, okay? So so basically they're gonna, um, I should say this. The, yeah, okay. There's, there's all those firms, okay? They're gonna be facing demand functions, so we'll see, okay? Then there's the aggregation technology, okay? The thing is that this goods aggregator kind of needs to be operated by someone or something. Okay, um, maybe it's a firm, for instance. Okay, so you, I don't know. You can think about it like Walmart or a big box store or something like that, right? So they're just aggregating stuff. Um, so what we're going to assume basically is that that um, that aggregation step is sort of competitive. Okay, that um, and and that firm is going to sort of take prices as given. Okay, the prices that are sort of posted by the intermediate firms, and then just choose what to buy optimally and and go from there okay but it that that means that you know if if the intermediate firm charges a higher price the aggregation firms are going to buy less of that okay right and so then the intermediate firms knowing that that's going to influence their decision okay but but the critical assumption is basically competitive aggregation um and then monopolistic production of the intermediates because these intermediates we're assuming have patents on their products that last forever in this case okay so um all right, so then the way we're going to go through this, okay, is we're going to solve the problem of the aggregator firm first, taking these prices as given, and then we're going to use, that's going to give us a demand function or an inverse demand function, and we're going to use that for the intermediates, okay? So so, so, um, so we're the aggregator firm, and we're taking... Well, so we're taking all these PIs, okay? And with that, what we're gonna get is, you know, a bunch of YIs and, and, and implicitly a Y, okay? So that's gonna be what we're doing, okay? And if you think about sort of what's, what's the objective of the aggregator firm, okay? Well, it's it's just gonna be uh, what they, the total, their revenue, okay? Which is gonna be what? Well, it's gonna be what they produce, okay? Um, 
which again is just this uh, here to here. Now you'll notice that I've just put Y. Okay. Now in principle, there's a price on this uh, this production. With that point, um, we're going to assume that y, the price of final good Y is going to be one. Okay, so we can always normalize one of the goods and then keep everything relative to that. May as well just do the the, the final aggregate good. Okay, so then you know in print in general I would put a P in front of that, but we're just going to assume that's one. Okay. Now you might say, well, there's different time periods. Okay, so can we do it at every time period? It turns out yes, because um, because we have an interest rate. Okay, so the interest rate is going to tell us about prices, how they're changing over time, or everything's going to kind of be loaded into the interest rate. Okay, um, it it's not 100% obvious, but it is basically without loss of generality to assume that the price of the final good is one in every at every time period, because the p there's these little pi's are are going to be relative to that. Okay. And then any, like, if you did have it varying, you can kind of show that it's all going to end up in the interest rate, basically. And so you can just sort of redefine the interest rate. Okay, so it's it's fine if you just put every, anything intertemporal goes in the interest rate, anything across products is going to go into the little PIs. Okay, and so then P is just one. Okay. Um, all right, so, okay, so that's Y output. That's their revenue. And then their input costs are, well, they have to actually buy all these products, okay? And that's a linear process. So it's just the integral from zero to N of PI, YI, DI, right? You got N different little I product lines. They each have their own price. You're making certain decisions about YI, okay? And you're gonna make those optimally in a second. Uh, and so that's gonna be your total cost, okay? And you don't have any other, you don't have to like, you don't have any other costs associated with this over there negligible or something like that. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> all right. So that's, that's capital. This is capital pi because we're going to have pi i, little pi i later on. So just, this is capital pi. That's total profits. That's going to be zero if things are competitive and they are, right? Okay. Um, so now how do we solve this problem? Okay. We're gonna, they, we want them to choose uh, y i optimally given p i. So we're going to take a derivative. Okay. Now it's a little weird. Okay. Because, you know, the, the max is over a continuum of YIs, right? We have a, from zero to N is continuum of, of YIs. You know, so I'm going to take a, I'm going to write, you know, del pi del YI. And the question is, what is that? For a specific YI? Technically, it's zero, right? These are infinitesimally small in the grand scheme of things for a given i, right? So technically, it's zero, okay? Um, but you can kind of write it out as if it was zero, right? You can take a derivative of, of these expressions with respect to yi, okay? And you'll you'll get something, and it turns out that that will be basically the right thing, okay? So 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 what I'm saying is like. You know, imagine imagine I had an optimal plan where I was choosing YI optimally, and then I came up to you, or you had, let's say you had the plan, and I came up to you, jokester that I am, and I said, for good I equals 0.378, I want you to set Y to a trillion. I'm like, okay, that's not going to affect pi at all because it's intensely small. Okay, so it's, it's, so, so, because of the continuum, you know, you can you can joke around for for a, a measure zero set of eyes, and that's fine. Let's just assume that you don't do that, okay? That not only do you 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 do this optimally generically, but you just do it for every single eye, okay? Because it's just easier that way. All right. So so that that's a sort of caveat about the continuum here. But once once you get beyond that, then it, you know it, it really is just for for each individual uh, y i, you're sort of behaving optimally, okay? For 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 that yi and, and you're kind of acting as if it wasn't infinitesimal in some sense okay so uh what do we get so it, we want to take this derivative sort of just as it looks um okay so this the ces thing you know it's a little complicated but it's not the worst okay so you're going to get um the exponent bring that down and then you're going to get the whole thing again uh the integral from zero to n 
Okay. And now but we have to decrement this by one. Okay, so with these um these you we we're gonna end up we're gonna end up seeing fractions like this a lot. And you're just like at some point you're just gonna be able to say, oh, I know that if I have epsilon over epsilon minus one and I subtract one, that gives me one over epsilon minus one. Okay, because if you combine the fractions and then work it out, it works out that way. So you're, sub you're subtracting epsilon minus one from the top, so you kill off the epsilon and you get a plus one. Okay, so if you do this enough, it'll just become second nature. Okay, but but uh, when you subtract one from this exponent up here, you're, you're, you're just going to get one over epsilon minus one. Okay, so that's the first step. Okay, so we're not done though, because we got the chain rule to worry about. The chain rule, what's inside, okay, is going to give us an epsilon minus one over epsilon, which notably will cancel the previous one. Um, and then we're going to get yi turns to be minus one over epsilon because this, where are we? This thing here is really, if you if you divide through, it's one minus one over epsilon. So then when you take the derivative, you're still left with that one over minus one over epsilon. Okay, so we got that. Um, and that's that's it for that first term, okay? And it's going to simplify substantially. And then the second one, the derivative with respect to yi, it's just pi. That's just your marginal cost, okay? So and this should be zero. So so really, you know, that first thing is the marginal revenue. The second thing is the marginal cost. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost, right? So, um, okay. But the first thing is going to simplify substantially. So these two, this is a CRS thing, are going to cancel because they're inverses of one another. Okay, the epsilon fractions. Um, that the the big thing in in uh, brackets. So remember why this here is why that whole thing in brackets. The thing on the second line in brackets is is if you think about it, it's actually just y, but with with without that epsilon. So it's y to the one over epsilon, right? So to go from this thing in brackets to this thing in brackets is just a one over epsilon power okay so 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 we can substantially simplify that by having y so there's a lot of stuff inside y but you know algebraically that is the case okay um and then we have yi to the minus one over epsilon okay and then minus pi equals zero okay so you can see things have, have gotten simpler and we're going to have some exponents that we can combine to and so this implies that uh you know pi is going to be equal to uh, y over yi, which is one over epsilon. Okay, so move pi over, combine the uh, y and yi uh, into one single fraction with the, with that common exponent, one over epsilon. Okay, so that is what we get. Um, now, you know, the, the original charge was finding yi given pi, right? So this is a, this is a, an inverse demand function. We want a demand function. Okay, so we're just gonna we can solve for yi instead. Okay, so if we solve for yi, well then we're gonna get um basically yi is gonna be y times pi to the minus one over epsilon. Okay. Um so you just sort of in, invert that solve for yi as a function of pi. And you're going to get, uh, making sure to get your sign and your exponent right, you're going to get y i is y times p i to the minus one over epsilon. Okay. And so this is, this is our demand function, right? This says, you know, given that the, the aggregation firm is choosing optimally given your posted price, if you're an individual uh, producer um, of good i, you're going to post some price p i, and then you're going to expect for them to buy y i. Okay, and then once you know that, then you know you you can calculate pi times yi. You know your costs. You can calculate everything, and so it's enough for you to to figure out your profit and and make a decision contingent on that. Let me think. Oh yeah, it is. You're right. Even better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so, all right, so yeah, so it's still, you know, still, still decreasing everything, so that's good. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, so, but it's important to have that because that'll influence revenue. Um, 
Okay, so uh, yeah, so so your your um, this is your your demand function. We're gonna use this as an input for now the next step down the ladder, which is these intermediate producers. Okay, and uh, it's we're we're a little short on time. Okay, so um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so then I'll give you the, the the approach that we're gonna take for the intermediates, and then probably be out of time. Okay, so now um, a couple of things. So so one thing is you know, we, we still have this Y floating in here, right? So in some sense, there's a, let's see, uh, there's sort of um, an aggregate dependency, right? So what you choose for your YI depends on the aggregation of what everyone else is choosing for their YI. So there's sort of this consistency thing that needs to, to be worked out. For now, you know, your, your infinitesimal is a single I. We're just gonna. So you're not gonna influence. I, you're not gonna influence y itself, right? So so um, we're just gonna take y as given for individual eyes and and go as far as we can. And then later on, we'll 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 get some consistency condition to make sure that everything kind of adds up. It's almost like a Nash equilibrium with a continuum of agents thing, but it's gonna be simple. It's not, we're not gonna get like mixed strategies or anything like that. Okay, so um, there is a consistency thing lurking in the background, but it's not gonna it's not gonna cause us any. Uh, issues it'll it'll be it'll be fine okay um but uh but also it, it you know there is an indeterminacy because uh y is constant returns to scale that aggregator is constant returns to scale so um if everyone doubles their yi for some reason they just decide on that that's going to double y which means your op their the optimal choice of y is going to double so it's like there is an overall scale indeterminacy which we haven't figured out. Um, that's going to come from the labor market because that'll determine how much we can actually produce. This is telling a sort of a relative thing. All right. Um, trying to, can we? Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. So, so yeah, so this, 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 this thing at the end here is telling you given like relative prices, how does relative uh, production change? And actually if I had gone through and not chosen P equals one and had a, had a P right in front here, you actually would have gotten the ratio of Y is equal to the ratio of P raised to the minus epsilon. Right. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, so you, it, yeah, so yeah, you can think about it just like it's, it's how do you allocate things relatively? Is what this is telling us okay and then the overall levels are coming from the labor market okay all right so um okay so then uh let's 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 keep moving so so the last thing okay i'll just sort of tell you how how we're going to approach moving into the intermediate goods um world okay um well okay so so i'll just write it here because i, I want to have this handy so the the when we go to intermediate goods we're going to be thinking about um, the profit uh, for good, for firm I producing good I. Okay, um, so you can uh, so if you look down here, we have two. We we have a demand function here y i equals y times p i to the minus epsilon. We also have an inverse demand function. Okay, telling you if you want to sell a certain quantity y i, what price should you charge? Basically, that's what that's what the inverse demand function is telling you. Now, uh, so so for that reason, if we if we want to think about the optimal choice of an intermediate producer, they we can either think about it as choosing y. Okay, so you, you choose y, then this inverse demand function tells you, you know, if I want to clear that, if I want to sell all that stuff, which I do, then I should choose price pi. Then that'll tell me where my revenues and, and everything. Okay, so uh, you can think about it in terms of choosing y, or you can think about it in terms of choosing p. You say, okay, I'm going to choose price P. That's going to mean that the this uh, aggregator is going to buy a quantity YI and I'll get some revenue and then I can calculate my cost. Okay, so it's equivalent to phrase the optimization in terms of choosing PI or YI because there's a one-to-one -one mapping between them from these demand functions on the right. Okay, in any case, you know, your profit for the intermediate is going to look like this. Your, your revenue, PI times YI, minus W 
times li. So w is the wage, li is your labor input. But we also know from before that, that li is equal to yi. So it's a perfectly one unit linear production process. Okay, so this is going to be also equivalently pi yi times w yi, which is, you know, <clears throat> pi minus w times yi. Okay, so you, you, because of that very simple production function yi equals li at the intermediate level, um, we can we can also write it like this. Okay, so um, now the wage is, I mean, it's out there, it's lurking, it's gonna influence your profits, we haven't determined it yet. In the end, the wage is gonna be determined by uh, the, the labor market clearing condition. So, so the wage is gonna be determined such that the amount that these firms demand is equal to the amount that's kind of out there in supply. Okay, um, and that's actually going to be the channel by which we'll set that scale, that overall scale of production in, a, in, a, in an equilibrium. Okay, so um, yeah, okay, so then, you know, the, the next step then is plug in this, this inverse demand function basically over here somewhere, okay, um, and figure out what, uh, take a derivative basically, okay, and then we're going to get some optimal production level. Okay, and that's going to be a function of, well, basically this is the wage, um, epsilon, the you know, various parameters, but in this case there's epsilon. Okay, um, and that's it. Okay, so you're going you're going to get some. What you're going to get out is some yi, and also some pi implicitly. That's going to be a function of epsilon and w, and oh sorry, and y itself overall. Capital y. Okay, so um, because that's that that shows up in these these demand functions here. Okay, so um, so that's that's what we'll do next time. Okay, um, and then the only other thing I'll say is uh, you know you can see you can see you can work through the intuition on these demand functions. Okay, so how does the sub you know how a substitutable thing a thing different goods are is going to influence how elastic the demand is. Okay, that, that's right. If things are highly substitutable, demand's going to be very elastic because people are going to jump ship if you raise the price a little bit, right? So, so you get the same intuition going through these, these demand and inverse demand functions regarding substitution, substitutability, okay? Um, and then you can even see, this will be kind of relevant later when we do Schumpeterian models, is that when you, when you have epsilon equals one, okay, and this will probably be the last thing I do today. Uh, when you have epsilon equals one, then you get yi is equal to y over pi, or in other words, pi yi is equal to y. Okay, so I guess I should. So when you have epsilon equal to one, oops, you get that um, that revenue is constant. Okay, so that means that regardless of what price you choose, you're going to get the same amount of revenue. Okay. Um, and so that, that actually, you know, you can see that, that, that things kind of break down when you hit epsilon equals one, because if you think about you're the intermediate producer, regardless of what price you choose, you get the same amount of revenue. Okay. Uh, you want to <clears throat> minimize costs. Okay. So you would just set the highest price that you possibly could sell it to this one, you know, infinitesimally small fraction of consumers who really want that good. Okay, so your 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 costs are going to be practically zero because you're producing practically nothing. You're getting the same revenue as if you had charged a reasonable price. Okay, so this is this is the Martin Shkreli, you know, jack up the price of some random pharmaceutical outcome, uh, and and just sell it to a very small number of people. Okay, so so there the problem is that things are um, once you hit a certain level of uh, in substitutability, you know, people need this good, for instance, a, a drug, a life-saving drug, you end up in these situations. So that's why you can't go too far in epsilon space, especially to one. Okay, so, all right, so I'm a little over time anyway. So, um, yeah, that's that's where next time we'll, we'll solve the intermediates and then sort of hopefully bring in, a, a, you know, market clearing conditions and go full circle and, and get their incentives to do research and then a, a growth rate of, of technology and, and hence the economy. Okay, so... All right, um, office hours tonight, cursed office hours. Uh, I'm going to be there, all right? Um, <laughs> it, I mean, some, some things may come up, but I, I'm going to, I will slay demons to be there, all right? Um, 
And yeah, so if you, if you got questions, comment down. All right, and otherwise, I'll see you next week.